If you try and look up the history of Philippine coffee on Google, it would go something like this. A Franciscan friar brought coffee from Mexico and planted them in Lipa, Batangas in the year 1740. And during the 1800s, Lipa Gobernador Silio Don Halo de los Reyes made planting of coffee trees mandatory for all residents. And with the help of Augustinian friars, by 1859, up to two-thirds of Lipa was planted with coffee. Lipa became the epicenter of coffee production in the Philippines. But in the year 1889, coffee leaf rust devastated the coffee plantations and the immense wealth that the Lipa coffee barons enjoyed was no more. Now, this version of the story is almost universally accepted and is definitely the most widespread. Many coffee websites feature some kind of version of this story. So, it sounds awesome, doesn't it? The glory, the splendor, the extravagance, the romance, a rise and fall story. It's so appealing. But, this history appeared kind of superficial to me. It was lacking detail. I mean, for a coffee-producing country like the Philippines, We've been producing coffee for more than 200 years. There's got to be more depth, more detail, more nuance behind this whole history, this whole origin story of growing coffee. Displeased with what I've found, I wanted a more nuanced understanding of our coffee growing history. So I dug deep. I dug deeper into the annals of the internet and found a gem of a work Demythologizing the History of Coffee in Dipa Batangas in the 19th Century by Bel Castro. According to Bel Castro's work, there are three points that seem off and invalid about this story, which she calls actually a myth, not a story. One, the myth claims that in the year 1740, a Franciscan friar brought coffee into the Philippines from Mexico. She finds this dubious. The second, the popular story told about the history of coffee in the Philippines is one of grandeur. Yes, but not necessarily completely true. The Philippines, as the story claims, was the world's fourth largest exporter of coffee in the entire world. And that at one point had a monopoly on coffee sometime between 1886 to 1888. And finally, the claim that coffee leaf rust ended the Philippine coffee boom. These three points about the story we just shared are all problematic. As Bel Castro eloquently demonstrates in her paper, all these three points are all problematic. For one, coffee was only introduced in Mexico in the years 1790 to 1794. So, how could the coffee arrive in the Philippines from Mexico 50 years earlier than it arrived in Mexico? In addition to this, the coffee varietal introduced in Mexico is Bourbon, not the typical varietal that was introduced in the Philippines at that time. Secondly, the Philippine coffee export was peaking in the 1880s, but even at our very highest point, we were only exporting 80,000 metric tons of coffee, only 1.5% of the entire world's production. So how can that possibly be the fourth largest exporting country? In addition, it's simply not possible for the Philippines to monopolize the sale or production of coffee. Coffee, which is a commodity held in very high demand from all over the world. True enough, if we consult the chart that Bel Castro demonstrates, other coffee producing countries were supplying a lot more coffee than us at that time, even during our supposed monopolistic coffee producing years. And for the third point, coffee leaf rust just does not work like that. It does not swiftly kill all its coffee all the coffee plants 
nor does it instantly wipe out all coffee production. Coffee plants hit with coffee leaf rust actually still bear viable coffee cherries. And we will see in Castro's investigation later on that it's actually a combination of many, many factors that led to the demise of our local coffee production. So now we ask the question, what actually happened? I'm sure everyone now has the burning desire to know. Ano nga ba talaga nangyari? So, these are two of my favorite theories from Castro's paper. And it's highly likely that both happened, but not necessarily at the same time. The first theory is that Arab traders or Muslim clerics introduced coffee here in the Philippines, owing to a Malay settlement somewhere in Taal River, Batangas. This theory becomes especially more likely given that Malabari Muslim traders and Sufi mystics were responsible for spreading coffee production and consumption in India, Ceylon, and Sumatra. Meaning, the very first coffee plants introduced in the Philippines may have been from Arabia or Indonesia. The other theory is that coffee's introduction was actually instigated by the Real Compañía de Filipinas during the year 1790. You see, if we take a look at global politics at the time, 1791 was the year that slave uprisings in French colony Saint Dominique occurred, thus leading to a decrease in the supply of coffee. At the same time, the Real Compañía de Filipinas was formed. This company promoted Philippine export crops from Manila to Spain, and they would have definitely picked up on this lucrative opportunity. Sensing the eventual lower supply of coffee in the world, due to the slave uprisings in St. Dominique, it would have been likely that the opportunistic businessmen behind the compañía would instigate the production of coffee in the Philippines for export. So given these two, we cannot be certain of exactly when, where, and how coffee came to the Philippines. But what we did know is the Spaniards via the Compañía were interested in trading it. And so they did. In the beginning, the Compañía started small. They would give cash advances to small growers to incentivize small growers to produce coffee. And then, as production grew, they enlisted the help of Gobernador Silios, Cabeza de Barangay, and your not-so-friendly local friars to help develop coffee in their respective areas. Of course, for a generous cut of the profits. Coffee as a cash crop for export gained momentum when Paul Proust de, I'm gonna butcher this, Le Gironere, won a prize of 100,000 pesos from the Sociedad Económica de Arigos del País <laughs> for raising 60,000 coffee plants. This prize money and recognition drew the attention of other Spaniards in the area. With the collective efforts of all these men, by the mid-1850s, Lipa was already exporting coffee to countries such as Australia, US, Britain, Spain, and France. The Spaniards and the wealthy local families controlling their coffee estates were essentially at the right place and at the right time during the years 1886 to 1889. Because you see, at that time, there was a shortage of coffee production from key and top producing countries such as Brazil and Indonesia. Low coffee supply and the insatiable hunger and demand for coffee in the West likely drove price upwards, and the local coffee barons of Lipa experienced a windfall. As a result, the local elite was able to enjoy the favorable effects of a commodity being in short supply and high demand, meaning the local elites got to sell the coffees they had for a high price. Since the production of coffee was going so well, and that they could meet the demand of the international customers. And this is presumably where all the past glory and illusions of wealth and fame come from. 
this short period in time where the stars aligned, where the complex web of global trade, supply and demand turned completely to the favor of the local elites. As a side note, as a passionate coffee roaster myself, you also have to ask the question, I also have to ask the question, what did the wealthy local elites do with their money? Did they reinvest? Did they build high-tech coffee systems? No! What did they do? Show off, of course. In an unprecedented show of wealth, the local coffee barons of Lipa built palatial homes, filled them with goods imported from the West, curtains from Paris, mirrors from Austria, stuffed chairs from Vienna, chandeliers from Germany, porcelain from France. There are even stories that depict these rich coffee families having their servants bring out sacks of gold coins and silver Mexican pesos from their storerooms and have their servants wash them and spread them out in piles along their mansion to dry in the sun. No wonder the industry died. The coffee boom eventually came to an end. A combination of factors led to the demise of the local coffee industry, especially in Lipa. Coffee leaf rust, wood boring worms, came to become a huge nuisance for the coffee estates and their farmers. Also, a huge issue as to the lack of sustainability in Lipa's coffee trade is that it is actually not the best place to plant and harvest Arabica coffee. Because you see, Arabica coffee comes from the mountains of Ethiopia. So it thrives in that kind of growing condition. Okay? High elevation, cool climate that encourages the slow growth of coffee cherries. So these mountains are situated, or these trees, these coffee trees in Ethiopia are situated around 1,700 to 2,200 meters above sea level. And Batangas, where Lipa is, is basically the opposite. The low elevation of around 312 meters above sea level was hot and humid and made the coffee trees grow too quickly, flower profusely, and exhaust rapidly. With no widespread effort to contain the infestation, nor enough money spent on proper research and development, the landed elites decided to switch crops. They cleared their coffee fields and moved to produce sugarcane, corn, and rice. So, what happens next in our story? Well, the next set of colonizers arrive. The Americans. So when the Americans colonized the Philippines, there was no great push to further cultivate coffee. The economic picture looked absolutely terrible for coffee production when the Americans came into the picture. At that time, there was a huge increase in the supply of coffee coming from Brazil, which saw the coffee price plunge to record lows that made coffee production not economically viable. As a result, the Americans pushed for the production of other cash crops such as tobacco, sugar, and hemp. So this was the story of the rise and fall of Philippine coffee from the 18th to early 20th century. I think a lot of lessons can be learned here. The quick rise and fall of the coffee industry isn't because the landed elite of Lipa were brilliant and enterprising business people. Their rise and quick demise owed to factors outside of their control. Trading coffee at the commodity level place them in the hands of the global market where they have no say or control over the price of the coffee that they were selling. And I think this is a valuable lesson that we must learn. As the Philippines right now is pursuing growth and development of a local coffee industry, it's important to set the stage correctly for coffee producers. Will we participate 
and sell commodities that will once again place our coffee producers in the hands of a finicky and unfair global commodities coffee market? Or will the government and private businesses put up incentives that will enable our local coffee producers to innovate and market and sell their products as specialty coffee? And create a system that allows our farmers to sell their coffee at a higher price commensurate to the amount of work and labor and costs involved in the production of their produce. Now, that's a story for another time. And if you want to see a video like that, comment down below and we'll make it happen for you. Special mention to the brilliant Bel Castro who authored the paper, Demythologizing the History of Coffee in the Pabatangas in the 19th Century, which, the, which was the main source we used to create this video. We would like to extend her message in her paper by inviting coffee lovers from all parts of the world to help us find more cool information about coffee. If you would like to reach out and collaborate, please do. You can email us or message us on Facebook or Instagram. That's it for today's video. Hope you liked our mini documentary. See you again soon. Thank you.